Good afternoon. On behalf of the Henry Center, it's my privilege to welcome you um, to this meeting we have to get together today in this lecture from Professor Richard Swinburne. Professor Swinburne is Emeritus Knowledge Professor of the Philosophy of Christian Religion at the University of Oxford and a fellow of the British Academy. He is the author or editor of well over two dozen books. His works have been translated into 20 languages. He is well, perhaps most well known for his uh, in very influential trilogy in the philosophy of religion and accompanying tetralogy in the philosophy of Christian doctrine. In addition, he's written about a 175 scholarly articles. Among his most recent publications are Mind, Brain, and Free Will, Was Jesus God, and Second Editions of the Trilogy. He is known as a fearless defender of all manner of unfashionable views, including libertarian free will and the subject of today's talk, mind-body dualism. His works are known throughout for their argumentative rigor, clarity of expression, engagement with contemporary work in the natural sciences, and fidelity to Christian truth. For many of us, he has been a landmark figure, um, a fearless defender of the Christian faith, and a remarkable intellect. We're really pleased to have together uh, with us Professor Richard Swinburne. Will you join me in welcoming him together? Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to organize this lecture in a somewhat different way from the way lectures are usually organized, uh, because I believe that some of you will have no acquaintance at all with philosophical terminology, and others will know it very well. So what I'm going to do uh, for my two-part argument is first to give you a quick survey of the first part of the argument, trying to avoid technical terms. I'm then going to introduce some technical terms, and I'm going to go through it again in a somewhat more rigorous way. After that, um, I'm going to open it to questions. First, questions of whether you understand what I'm saying, and secondly, to objections. And then, um, after a certain amount of that, I shall go on, if you haven't already raised them, to raise certain objections of my own to, to my view, and then I shall respond to them and produce a further extension of the argument. So the questions and answers will be at two places, first in the middle and then at the end. I'm going to argue for the view, as my title implies, that each of us, each human being, has two parts, their body, and their soul. And the soul is the essential part in the sense that I go where my soul goes. And uh, this particular body is not necessary for me. Maybe some less body is necessary for me. I don't even believe that. But um, uh, as far as the argument that I will give you is concerned, uh, all I shall show is that this particular body is not necessary for me, but my soul is necessary for me. That's what I'm going to argue for. And I shall start from uh, drawing your attention to a couple of modern neuroscience discoveries which are at the top of your handout. First, uh, neuroscientists are learning to repair severed nerves, not merely severed nerves in peripheral parts of the body, but several ner nerves uh, um, in the spine and therefore in the brain. Uh, this, has, this is on the way, that is to say, they've done it uh, for monkeys, uh, they've done it uh, sometimes in certain special uh, circumstances for human beings, but clearly the techniques are there, and it won't be too long before uh, they can repair any spinal uh, injury and any, bra any sever severing of brain. Of brain. Um, second 
discovery, uh, this time a theoretical discovery. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, the, uh, br the brain consists of lower part and, cer and cerebral, but the cerebrum, but the, the top part. And the top part has to operate uh, if we are to have a conscious life. And it goes on in that, that are necessary, and possibly sufficient, but at any rate necessary for our conscious life. But the top part has two parts, uh, and the top part of the top part, the cortex, uh, has two parts, a left and a right. And uh, they, to some extent, uh, it was obvious, duplicate each other. But uh, it has recently been discovered they duplicate each other in a more profound way. Um, uh, there are some few patients who have had to have their whole uh, one side, left or right, uh, cere uh, cerebral cortex removed um, uh, because it's the source of epileptic fits, which can't be cured in any other way. Um, and the remarkable discovery is that whether you take out the right hemisphere or whether you take out the left hemisphere doesn't make much difference to what people remember or believe or their general attitude to life. Um, the, it does make a bit of a difference to their motor capacities. That's to say, if you take out this part, they can't move the arm as easily and so on. But it doesn't make any significant difference to their um, memories and their beliefs and their uh, capacities for thought. OK, well, now then, uh, suppose uh, uh, this uh, is about the science proceeds uh, a little further in practical terms. There is already a mad Italian scientist who claims to be about to produce a head transplant, a whole head cut off and put, put somebody else's head on top. Uh, so far it hasn't happened, but it surely will happen. Um, uh, the difficulty so far has been uh, connecting the nerves to the, um, from the head to the rest of the body. But as I say, scientists are on the way to dealing with that problem. So that should be possible. Now, given that the nerves can be replaced, it will be surely possible not merely to cut out someone's left hemisphere, cerebral hemisphere, or right one, uh, but to replace it by another hemisphere taken from somewhere else. So, given that, uh, suppose, and here's the argument, next paragraph. Suppose you get hold of some poor person, Alexandra, and you take out not merely uh, the, the left hemisphere, but of both hemispheres, and you get hold of two other unfortunate people who we'll call Alex and Sandra, and you take out their hemispheres left and right as well and you put Alexandra's left hemisphere into Alex, and you put uh, Alexandra's right hemisphere into Sandra, and you connect them up. Now, clearly, uh, there's then enough for a functioning person, because as we've already seen, one hemisphere is enough for a functioning person. And since uh, the conscious life uh, depends on the cerebral cortex, and, on, and since each cerebral cortex seems to contain much of what is necessary for it, both subsequent persons will have uh, a cerebral cortex which will pr produce just the same beliefs, uh, memories, and so on, as the other one will. So you will have two subsequent people, each of whom are in a position to claim to be Alexandra, because they would both remember having been Alexandra and so on, and who will claim to have the same memories of uh, what she did. Now, um, which one will be Alexandra, if any of them? Well, there are three possibilities. First, that 
Alex is and Sandra isn't, secondly that Sandra is and Alex isn't, and of course the whole thing may have destroyed Alexandra altogether, and you in that case, if they are of two conscious people, they will be different conscious people. So, um, and that, so in that situation, you will not be in a position to know the answer, and you will not be in a position to know the answer whatever further experiments are done. Nothing will show you the answer because they'll both make just the same good claims about the previous Alexandra and they'll both have some of Alexandra's body. So you won't be able to, nobody will be able to find that out. Now, just consider one of these persons, uh, Alex. Um, Alex might be Alexandra, Alex might not be Alexandra. What would be the difference between Alex being Alexandra and Alex being not being Alexandra? Well, uh, consider this person just as, as she is. Um, she's got a certain brain, uh, reconstituted with a certain brain and certain memories. But it's compatible with all of that that she is Alexandra and that she's not Alexandra. So it's not what she claims to think and so on that makes her Alexandra, and it's not having part of the previous <laughs> Alexandra's brain that makes her Alexandra. So what is it? And it must be something else. She can't just be a different person. There must be something about her that makes her a different person. And since it's not the, anything in her conscious life, and since it's not anything in the in the physical brain matter, it must be something else. And since you know everything that's happened after the physical matter, it must be something that happens to the non-physical matter. And therefore, there must be a non-physical part that makes her Alexandra, that makes all the difference. She's Alexandra if she's got Alexandra's non-physical part, which of course we're going to call the soul. And she's not Alexandra if she doesn't have that. We don't know whether she's got it, but the question is, what would make her Alexandra? And that is got to be the answer, since nothing else can be making her Alexandra because it's compatible with everything else that she isn't Alexandra. And that is what I have argued in the first paragraph. That I go where my soul goes, there may be other parts necessary for me, but they can't be sufficient. They can't be what makes me me. So it's got to be something else. Now, there are other arguments, too, for the existence of a separate soul. Um, just to give you one argument uh, very quickly. Um, uh, there's... Uh, um, if, if there weren't any souls, then all that there would be about me that makes about me is simply my physical matter and the thoughts and feelings I have. And all there would be about you would be the physical matter and the thoughts and feelings you have. Uh, but uh, suppose we know, or suppose in an in a, in a earlier world, uh, you knew uh, all about uh, some of the people in this world, and you knew what the physical matter they were made of and what uh, feelings, uh, thoughts, conscious life was associated with it, there would still be a further question. Which of them is you? Uh, that is to say, there's a difference uh, if, if there are no souls um, uh, and all the truths are just truths about what happens to brain and body uh, and the mental life associated with that, then... Um, uh, there wouldn't be any difference between um, me being having this body and the mental life associated with that and you having that body and the mental life associated with that on the one hand and alternatively me having the brain and mental life associated with that and you having the brain and mental life associated with this. But there is a difference. There's all the world in the difference. So since it can't consist in the conscious life and it can't consist in the brain and body, it must consist in something else. And the only remaining thing is the non-physical part. 
Well, that I just give aside as a separate extra argument. I'm concentrating on the one that's on the handout. Now, uh, in order to uh, sharpen things up just a little, I've introduced some th definitions which you will find also on the end, I think it is, of your handout. Um, uh, they're all philosophical, technical terms. Uh, some of them are agreed ones that everybody in philosophy uses. Some of them are disputed ones in the sense that pe some people use these terms a bit differently to others. Now, the notion of logical necessity and logical possibility are very crucial for philosophical discor discourse. Um, philosophers argue about propositions, that is, claims about what the world is like. And some of these uh, are clearly uh, uh, self-contradictory or entail a self-contradiction. Um, uh, it couldn't be the case of both that um, the, uh, the world came into existence five minutes ago and that it has been many millions of years old. Uh, the conjunction of those two, that it came to existence five minutes ago and it's many millions of years old, is logically impossible. Um, it's something is logically necessary if whatever the world was like, it couldn't possibly be false. Uh, all squares have four sides. Whether or not there are any squares in the world, all squares have four sides. There couldn't be a world which didn't have squares with four sides. Um, may sound a trivial example, but many examples are a lot less com more, more complicated than that. But nevertheless, uh, they are logically necessary in the sense that to deny them in the end leads you to a contradiction. <coughs> and crucially for our point purposes, Something is logically possible if it describes a state of affairs which doesn't entail a contradiction, which it makes sense to suppose could be true. And there are lots and lots of false propositions which are logically possible. It is logically possible that the world came into existence five minutes ago. We don't think it, but it entails no contradiction to suppose this. <coughs> It is logically possible that there's a world in which the law of gravity doesn't hold, or it's logically possible that it doesn't hold in our world, in itself. Of course, it's not compatible with what else we know about the world, but the, the proposition there is a world in which the law of gravity doesn't hold is not logically contradictory. It's logically possible. And so, two propositions, P and Q, are compatible with one another if it's logically possible, there's no contradiction in supposing both P and Q, <coughs> and <coughs> um, um, it's lo it may be logically possible that both P and not Q, in that case, Q or not Q are equally compatible with P. Now, you remember a little while ago, I said that it's compatible with uh, somebody being Alex, that they had half of Alexandra's brain and certain thoughts and feelings, and it was compatible with this, that they had Ale that same brain and certain thoughts and feelings, and were not uh, Alexandra. And so, uh, being Alexandra is therefore something separate, something beyond having the brain and having the thoughts and feelings. That was the point, the sort of compatibility I'm talking about, consistency. Okay, now, um, substance. Uh, substance just means a thing. There are tables, chairs, planets, and so on are substances, and substances have other substances as parts. My desk has as parts drawers and a desk top. Um, among substances, substances are things that have properties and can have parts. <coughs> Among substances are you and me, persons are substances. And we have parts, and certainly heart and liver and so on are parts of us. And I am arguing the body is part of us, and I'm wanting to argue the soul is also part of us. They are substances. 
They are things. If there is a soul, it's a thing. It has properties. It's connect it, it is involved in having thoughts, and uh, it's connected to the body. Um, and what I'm arguing is that we are, as we presently are, uh, substances who have two parts, body and soul, just as my desk has several drawers. A property of a substance, uh, there are two sorts of properties. Uh, properties are things like <coughs> Uh, being green and square, and it, uh, uh, these are intrinsic properties. They are th properties which a thing has, quite apart from its relations to other things. On the other hand, being uh, 10 feet away from you is a relational property. It relates me to you. And both of these are properties possessed by things. And um, then there is the notion of an essential property. Now, an essential property of a substance is one such that it's logically necessary that it has that property, that it wouldn't exist without that property. And as the example I give on the handout is, uh, my desk wouldn't exist if it didn't occupy a volume of space. So occupying space is an essential property of my desk. And what I'm going to on to argue, of course, is that my soul is, uh, sorry, and as well as that, there is the notion of an essential part of something. The essential part of a substance is one that the substance wouldn't exist unless it had that part. And uh, uh, for, for, um, <coughs> uh, for example, um, uh, my desk wouldn't exist unless it had a surface to write on. It wouldn't be a desk. It wouldn't be a, unless it had a surface to write on. A table wouldn't be a table unless it had a surface. So the surface is an essential part of the table or desk. And what I'm going to, on to argue is that um, our souls are essential parts of us. We wouldn't exist without them. Now. I'm going to use the terms physical and mental, um, and I'm going to use them in the way that I state on the handout. The other uh, definitions I've given are pretty well agreed among philosophers, but they don't define physical and mental always in quite the same way as I do. Um, but I think my definition, as it were, to use a famous frames in philosophy cuts reality at the joints. That's to say, I think if you understand physical and mental in the way I understand them, uh, you will get to very clear distinctions between things. And so I'm going to define a mental property as one to which the person, the subject to whom the property belongs, has a way of knowing about it which is necessarily not available to anyone else. Uh, so, for example, if I'm in pain, being in pain is a property, but it's a property to which I have access in a way that you don't. And this is not a contingent matter. This is necessarily so. Um, whatever way you have of finding out whether or not I'm in pain, I could use. If you learn that I'm in pain by observing my behavior, I could observe my behavior by watching a video of it. Um, if you learn about my pain by observing some correlate of it in the brain, I could discover that. I could just see the self too. But I have a way of knowing about it by actually having it and experiencing you don't. So uh, I'm counting as physical uh, properties, one that it's necessary that the subject has access to in a way not available to anyone else. Um, and uh, I'm counting something as a pure mental property if, uh, sorry, and then of course a physical property is one which is publicly accessible. Uh, being a, uh, <laughs> being a chair uh, or uh, having that shape or uh, being that color in the sense of uh, uh, belonging to the same group which everybody else would recognize as having the same color, 
um, being the color white in that sense, is a physical property because it's a publicly accessible property. Now, among mental properties are what I call pure mental properties. Um, <coughs> some mental properties are ones which involve the instantiation of physical properties. For example, me looking at you, the property of looking at you, is something I can know better that I have than you do. But of course, it wouldn't be the case that I had this property unless you were there. And your being there, <laughs> uh, you occupying a place opposite to me, is uh, a physical property uh, of the world. Uh, but pure mental properties are ones which don't entail any physical properties. And our sensations like pains, our current thoughts like <coughs> it's Monday today, our current intentions, what you're doing in your, uh, when you're doing something, such as giving a lecture, uh, your beliefs and desires are pure mental properties. They include pro conscious properties, but they're not, uh, there are, our beliefs are ones which we are not conscious of all the time, and likewise our desires, but our sensations are ones we are conscious of all the time. <coughs> and finally, um, therefore, this distinction applies to phys uh, substances. Physical substance is a public substance in the sense that all its essential properties are physical. A mental substance is one which has one essential mental property, and a pure mental substance is one that has only pure mental properties as its essential properties. I'm going to argue that necessarily, well, it's fairly obvious that we are mental substances because unless we had the capacity for thought and feeling and so on, we wouldn't exist. We cease to exist when we cease to have a mental life. Um, but what I'm going to argue is that we are is pure mental substances that is to say, uh, we only need, uh, uh, we don't need a particular body in order to exist. Okay, now with those uh, terminology, you can sit now put the argument which is on the handout in that shape. Um, I say, consider this operation done. <coughs> I argue that. Um, this means that the substance which is Alexandra, um, the question is which subsequent substance is Alexandra. I argue that it's compatible with the substance that is Alex, um, uh, that that substance is now is Alexandra. I'm giving Alex and Sandra's names of the subsequent persons who uh, result from this operation. Um, I argue it's compatible with um, what has happened to Alexandra, that that is Alexandra. Um, and uh, both of the resulting persons have the same mental properties. The word in the middle of that paragraph, conscious, should read mental. Um, they all have both Alexandra and uh, both Alex and Sandra have the same mental properties as each other. Um, and um, when you now come on to just the one person that is Alex, um, I compare, I say there's two possibilities about her. Either that that person is um, Alexandra or that the person isn't Alexandra. And um, uh, the, uh, but both, as it were, of these persons, one that exists and one that doesn't, both of these persons have the same physical substance as part of them, that is to say the same body and half brain. They have the same mental properties and the same physical properties, and therefore they have all the same properties they have all the same physical parts. They can only differ if they have another part which is not physical, and that is uh, 
a further, they are made of two substances, the physical part and the mental part. And therefore, my conclusion again is that um, there's a difference between being Alexandra and not being Alexandra, and that must consist in Alexandra having a non-physical part, and that is what makes her who she is. Right, I've got to the end of that part, and I am now open to questions by people. First, if anybody hasn't understood any stages in that argument, do ask me now, and then uh, I welcome objections. Any questions for interpretation? Anyone follow or not follow something in that? All right, what's wrong with it then? Anyone want to raise an objection at this stage? I, this is. Uh... Yeah, I, I've got a question. Yeah. Did I hear you correctly when you when you made the statement that the two exist, but you have no mental life? Yes. Um, in my sense of mental, that is to say, um, something is a mental property if and only if the subject has privileged access to whether it's instantiated in them. Um, and in the case of our beliefs and desires, you know, we have innumerable beliefs we're not thinking about at the moment. But what makes them mental is that we can have access to them. And, uh, you know, I can ask myself, do I really believe the universe came into existence many thousands of years ago? And I can just, I, I have access to whether I believe this, which is of a, a sort that you can't have. Uh, so they're not necessarily conscious properties. They, they, they may be ones that we need to uh, bring to the surface. Um, but also, if you look at the handout, what I do also point out there is that uh, when I define mental property, though I, when I read it out, I didn't uh, include the uh, phrase in brackets, I pointed out that the capacity to have sensations and so on is also a mental property because we know better than anybody else whether we have that capacity or not. Um, uh, if, uh, if we don't have that capacity, nobody uh, knows that. I mean, if we do have that capacity, then we are in a better position to know that we do have that capacity than is anybody else. Now, suppose we lose all those capacities, then um, there we are on the slab. And if we're not, in some, some sense, capable of uh, coming to li life again, and, and nobody can make us come to life again and have these capacities again, then we're dead. And of course, the, ev uh, the evidence that we, we can't be brought to life again will consist in, in some uh, definition of brain death uh, accessible to the, the medic. But if, if we have lost the capacity and will not recover the capacity for a mental life, then we are no more, even if the body is ticking over. That's what I was arguing. Um, does that answer your question? Ah, yes, well, um, uh, uh, I said the soul is necessary for our existence. I didn't say it's sufficient for our existence. Um, I say we have to have a soul in order to exist. But if we were to, l if we lose a total capacity for having thoughts and feelings and so on, then we would cease to exist. But I left it open that the soul, those, uh, that capacity might be possessed by the soul rather than the body. And in that case, if we go on thinking and feeling, we continue to exist. Okay. Are we there? Yes.
Uh, yes, yes, it does. Uh, it applies to any animals who have a conscious life. Um, we don't, of course, know <laughs> how far down the animal uh, chain uh, con there is consciousness. I don't think the invertebrates are conscious, but um, uh, somewhere, um, perhaps it's only vertebrates, perhaps it's only mammals. Uh, but certainly, I think cats and dogs are conscious, yes, and therefore it does indeed follow that they must have, in that sense, souls, um, <coughs> immaterial parts which make them who they are. Um, the medievals talked of uh, three sorts of souls. They talked of veg vegetative souls, which plants had, and uh, uh, sensitive souls, which animals had, and rational or intellectual souls, which uh, uh, humans had. And um, they were very happy about talking about animal souls, but the, the, what they thought was all important and only worth keeping alive for the future was uh, uh, rational or intellectual souls, and that's what we have. Uh, but there's clearly a difference between us and the animals in, in the mental properties we can have, in, in the capacities. I mean, I don't think uh, any animal has moral beliefs or a uh, capacity for logical reasoning. Um, and these are the things that make us <laughs> different sorts of, our souls quite different sorts of souls from other ones. Okay. Um, well, I'll just take it a bit, I think I'll do a slight, I'll think I'll go to the second stage of the argument, and then we'll come to objections afterwards. Um, if you look right towards the end of the handout, you will see next stage of the argument. And I'll run through that paragraph now. Now, all that the Alexandra um, uh, operation showed uh, was that um, we need something else besides uh, the physical matter of the earlier Alexandra um, for the subsequent person to be Alexandra. Um, uh, but it didn't show that uh, where you could have a future Alexandra who didn't have any of the original physical matter. And therefore, I ask you to consider another thought experiment which would show that. Um, now, suppose Alexandra has a brain disease and it only affects a certain part of the brain, uh, about a tenth of the brain, and um, it is necessary to remove it. So the surgeons remove it, but with the advance of surgery, they can now not merely remove it, but replace it with a similar, a similar part from some unfortunate corpse um, and um, plug it in and uh, uh, you get a person who has a brain with, with the same parts as before. Uh, but it's only affected a tenth of the, the, the person. And so uh, since it's just a replacement of a tenth of the, the brain, you might reasonably think you've got the same person as before. Unfortunately, the disease spreads to another part of the brain, uh, which also has to be cut out and is similarly replaced. And this goes on for, uh, at intervals of a year, for 10 years. At the end of the 10 years, you have a brain, none of which was obtained from the original Alexandra. Um, but at each stage, it seems very reasonable to suppose that um, <laughs> you've still got the same person as before. After all, uh, uh, as we know well, a lot of people have a tenth of the brain cut out for, for ordinary surgical reasons. The only difference here would be that it's been replaced by a piece of similar size. So given that, it's, uh, it might seem at any rate logically possible, compatible with the data, that the person at the end still is Alexandra. On the other hand, it has nothing of Alexandra's brain, so it also seems logically possible that she's not Alexandra. So, um, it is therefore uh, 
compatible with uh, uh, not having any of the uh, brain matter of the original Alexandra, the, the subsequent one should be Alexandra. Um, and therefore, <laughs> there's got to be something else that makes a difference. And there's something else, uh, this, this, the advances in this stage of the argument, you don't know, need any, this is an argument show, you don't need any of the original brain matter for it to be Alexandra. Any questions about this advance? <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering if that actually follows entirely. Because one could argue that as long as pieces of the brain are replaced slowly enough, that they are rightly incorporated into the organism, that they then qualify as Alexander's brain at each stage along. Well, what it shows is that no part of Alexandra's brain at year one, year naught, uh, is necessary for it to be Alexandra at year 10. That's all that I'm showing. Um, and um, uh, what you reasonably suppose is that at no stage along the ra road does it cease to be Alexandra. On the other hand, there is a, a counter feeling that uh, <laughs> if you consider the one at the end of the one at the beginning, there must be um, uh, there must be some stage at which uh, there's a quick flip over, um, because it does seem re uh, at any rate logically possible, and that's all that I need for each stage of the argument. Seems logically possible that at the end, that, that to be Alexandra, you have to have some of Alexandra's original matter. Uh, I know that most of for the rest of the body, uh, as it were, um, matter is replaced every seven years or so, but that doesn't in general, or it's not known in general to apply to the brain, to the neurons. Um, I think the present scientific evidence is that uh, um, some of the brain always remains through life, um, but uh, the science is not uh, not clear about this, I don't think. But um, uh, so there is, uh, it is quite natural to suppose that um, uh, some of it should be needed, um, and some people would say, well, if none of it's there, it's really another person. Uh, it may look like Alexandra, and it may not, but uh, at any rate, it seems both results seem logically possible, and that's all that the argument shows. Uh, oh, sorry, that's all that's needed to show the conclusion, because it shows that no original part is necessary for uh, being Alexandra, because uh, both um, someone could be Alexandra without having any of the original matter and also could be Alexandra while having uh, um, um, <laughs> could be Alexandra or could not be Alexandra or equally compatible with having none of the original matter. And therefore there must be something that makes one of them the original uh, later Alexandra and it can't be any of the original matter because you've got me. That's all it's designed to show. Whose perception of who Alexander is are we talking about? The external people around Alexander recognizing her as in continuity with previous Alexander. Alexander's own self-awareness of being Alexandra or the divine view of this. Well, we haven't brought God into it, and I'm not going to bring God into it. <laughs> because this is a purely secular argument for the soul. Um, um, but uh, as regards the people, well, we are the people around, and the answer is we haven't got a clue, and we can't have a clue. And as regards uh, the later Alexandra, 
uh, well, uh, if one of them is Alexandra, of course that one will be convinced she is Alexandra. The trouble is, another one will be equally convinced that they're Ale she's Alexandra. So the mere Alexandra's conviction is not going to be enough to show. And uh, uh, when this is presented to the two people, they will realize that they are equally convinced that they are Alexandra and have an equal dependence, so they don't know whether they're Alexandra. Um, yes, I agree, God may know the answer, but my point is, we can't, and uh, uh, in order for there to be an answer, there must be a difference. That I'm concerned with what the difference consists in. Um, uh, there must be something that makes it a difference. The difference between God and us is he will know what it is and where it's gone, but we can't because it's a non-physical thing. Well, yes, I, I didn't uh, bring in the body at all uh, because um, I was assuming, perhaps I should have said this, uh, that when this experiment that Dr. Sergio Canavero uh, claims to be about to do of a head transplant is done, uh, we would automatically assume that the, the subsequent person is the one that has the head rather than the rest of the body. And the reason why we assume that is because the whole conscious life is d dependent on the brain. And uh, the same intuition is surely right in, in the case where it's only not the whole head, but, but only the brain and, uh, uh, that's, tra that's transplanted. So um, I think that's reasonable because our, <laughs> what makes us us is our con us continuing to have a mental life, as I suggested, and that depends on the brain and not on the rest of the body. Well, I could make a few objections to myself in that case. Um, oh. Ah, yes, uh, all right. Well, let's explain to the rest of the community what this is. Um, uh, I was uh, adopting what is known as an endurantist -dur theory of time. As to say, I was assuming uh, there's truth about us, which is a truth... Uh, <laughs> It holds now whatever has happened in the past or will happen in the future. Uh, I now am having this and doing that and so on. Um, the full dimensionalist claims that um, uh, we can't identify anything. Uh, uh, things aren't what they are solely in virtue of what's the case now. What makes something what it is it depends on its past and future. Now, uh, if you had a, had a, di had a, uh, a diagram and you represent uh, time on the uh, uh, lower axis and um, you trace just up one axis uh, spatial differences, and you imagine uh, as Alexandra is represented by a sort of worm-like thing which splits at a certain moment of time so that one worm goes this way and the other worm goes that way. And the uh, four-dimensionalist might say, well, uh, the truth of the matter is, therefore, 
that the original Alexandra, as it were, has two branches, and one of them is, uh, <laughs> they are both successors of uh, the uh, earlier Alexandra, and so they're uh, both parts of the uh, original Alexandra, uh, but they, um, Alexandra splits into two. Is that, uh, or, yeah. um, yes, uh, well, uh, that was in fact my objection too. Um, and Uh, to the second objection. Now let's go back a bit on that. That is to say, the theory I am putting forward, as you will probably realize, is a highly unfashionable theory philosophically. And most philosophers hold that um, being Alexandra or being me is a matter of whether the later person has enough of the original me uh, and whether the later person has enough memories of the original me and enough character the same as the original me. That's to say, being the later person is a matter of having uh, much of the earlier person's body, brain, and so on, and much of the earlier person's mental life. Um, and, but the trouble of that with that sort of theory is, as my earlier discussion will obviously bring out, you could have two equally good candidates for satisfying this. So uh, it's not, in my view, plausible. But nevertheless, even though it is not, to my mind, plausible, uh, a lot of people do produce what uh, I have called on the handout a complex theory of our personal identity. That's to say, personal identity is a matter of how much of these different characteristics, and you can, uh, different philosophers have emphasized the me importance of mental continuity to determining who we are, and other ones have uh, thought of physical continuity, and others of brain determining who we are. But you run into this difficulty that that can't possibly settle the issue. Now, so how, how is the modern philosopher going to save some form of physicalism in the light of this? And um, one way they do it, initially, is to say, well, there are truths about who is the later person in the case of where there's fairly obvious continuity, in other words, only one later candidate for being the earlier candidate, uh, whether when the later person has most of the brain of the earlier person and most of the same mental life, uh, and uh, a later person isn't that earlier person in the case where doesn't have much of the original brain and much of the original mental life, but um, there's a sort of intermediate area where it's neither true nor false that one of the later persons is or isn't the same as the earlier person. And in the first uh, example, the first, in my original thought experiment, that will be the case because uh, each of them, as it were, has 50% of the um, uh, uh, cerebral cortex of the original person. Um, so there's an area where it's neither true nor false. Uh, well, difficult to see what it would mean to say that it's neither true nor false that uh, the, the later person, one, a later person is uh, Alexandra. But if you say that, then you run into another difficulty. That is to say, how broad is this neither true or false area? If, um, if you say, well, uh, there's really a true answer that she is Alexandra if she has 60% of uh, the brain of the original Alexandra, but it's neither true nor false that she is Alexandra if she has only 59% of the brain. And that's beginning to look highly arbitrary. It is highly arbitrary. Why make the cutoff point there rather than anywhere else? Um, um, and faced with that difficulty, then 
this kind of approach uh, leads people to say, yes, um, there is no cutoff point. The point is that any person is, <laughs> who has uh, only uh, some of the brain is only partly the same as the original Alexandra. Uh, and so you get a notion of partial identity. Uh, a person is Alexandra to the extent to which the later person has some of the earlier Alexandra. And so you, the later person could be 99% Alexandra or 96% Alexandra or so on. But what would it be like for a person to be partly Alexandra? Um, and the problem is to spell this out in a coherent way. And a number of philosophers, uh, I haven't mentioned any names so far, but um, some very famous uh, names in recent Anglo-American philosophy have all adopted this view. Uh, Derek Parfit, David Lewis, and uh, Robert Nozick have all uh, adopted that view. But now let's see what it, just what it means. Uh, we can understand this notion of partial identity when, when we're dealing with inanimate things. Um, suppose I have a table and um, it's uh, broken up and the, the, the table top and one of the legs is uh, uh, taken take, is um, used to make with some legs got from somewhere else another table, and the rest of my original table is also used with legs and bits and to make a second table. Now, it's reasonable to suppose in that sense that um, the two, each of the later tables, we can say, is partly the same as the original table, and it will be a matter of degree. I mean, the more bits of the original table you have, the more it is, the uh, more it's identical to, to that original table. And that works all right for inanimate things, but we are conscious beings, and it doesn't work quite as well for that. Because, and this is, is on your handout, it's on, I'm dealing with the second objection, and this is the response to this objection. Um, what does it mean to say that Alex is partly, partly identical to Alexandra? Um, well, um, if we use the, the table analogy, it will mean that um, uh, 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 each of them will have the experiences of different parts of Alexandra, just as uh, in the case of the table, they're partly identical because uh, one of them is the same as one of the parts of the original table. But when we're dealing with experiences, experiences aren't had by parts of a person, they're had by the whole person. Um, sure, there are parts of the brain which give us our auditory experiences and parts of the brain which give us our visual experiences and so on, but they cause in us they say, uh, we have them simultaneously. It's the same person who has the auditory experiences as has the visual experiences and so on. There is only one subject of experience here. Um, and so it can't be the case that uh, uh, one of the later persons has the experience of part of Alexandra, because part of Alexandra doesn't have any experiences at all. Um, so what can it mean? Well, perhaps it can mean, as it were, that each of them, uh, I mean, Alexandra has, uh, in each of them, ha has uh, the experiences of Alex and the experience of Sandra subsequently, uh, only perhaps to a less extent. But of course, they are Alex and Alexandra are now totally different people. They live a, they leave a room by different doors. They have different conscious experiences and so on. No one person has all, the, uh, uh, all of those experiences. So how can it be that Alexandra has, has those experiences? Because no one has all of them. 
How can it be, well, perhaps Alexandra only has some of them, but no, uh, but, um, uh, in that case, um, um, she wouldn't, if she was to be partly each of them, she must have uh, some of the experiences which each of them has. But no one person has some of the experiences which each of them has. So it really doesn't make sense to talk of partial identity when you're dealing with conscious beings, because all the experiences of a conscious being come together, and you either have them or you don't. And um, so I can't make any sense of that suggestion. And I don't think uh, um, Parfit and co. have made any serious attempt to do so. They have just said that you know, we are partly like that and it's like tables and chairs, but we're not like tables and chairs because we have experiences. And while tables and chairs can be broken up, we as subjects of experience don't consist of parts which can be broken up, so it doesn't work. Um, it does, of course, their view would have the consequence, uh, which they are happy to draw, uh, that what looks like the same person this year isn't really the same person as the person last year because he hasn't got quite the same brain and the same memories and so on. And therefore that runs against the common intuition on this matter. But I'm not relying on the common intuition. I am relying on, you can't make sense of um, two later people. Each, <laughs> the earlier person, Alexandra, being partly identical with one and partly identical with the other. Because if they were, that was the case, these would have to be partly identical with each other and to share some of their experiences, and they don't in this hypothesis. So that's my response to this suggestion. Any, anyone want further input on, on that one? Uh, yeah? I'm sure I'm uh, uh, ignorant of something here, but if the soul were ubiquitous, couldn't we say that Alexandra coexisted co with Alex and Sandra on the one hand, and that on the other hand, with Alex and Sandra, they also had two persons within each body? Uh, yes, the, the, um, it has been suggested, in fact, um, <laughs> that we are all two persons. Um, the, just to sort of start reinforcing that one, um, the, it is w known uh, if in, instead of, as it were, taking out half of, uh, uh, taking out, uh, of the left cerebral cortex, uh, you just, which is a, a, called anatomical hemispherectomy, uh, you just sort of separate them, uh, which is called a functional hemispherectomy, by cutting the main connection between the two hemispheres. And indeed, some people are born like that. Um, People to whom this has happened do behave in totally normal ways, except in a rather odd situation. The odd situation is if you um, uh, sort of put a screen up in the middle of each of their eyes so that uh, they get one input from one side of the body onto the right side of each of the eyes, an input from the other side onto the left um, side of the eye, and similarly, as it were, you uh, uh, yeah, anyway, that'll do. Um, and now input on from this side will go to the left hemisphere, and input from that side will go to the right hemisphere. And our limbs are once under the control of the opposite hemisphere. So this is under the control of that hemisphere, that is under the control of that hemisphere and the mouth is normally 
under the control of the left hemisphere. Right. Now, when you show such people, for example, a, a, a tray on which there are various items, um, and there is a key, and there is a ring, and there is a key ring, and you will ask them to what, what they see. Um, and uh, they, they have to write down the answer with, with their hand. And uh, the person who, if the key is on the left side, so that it's seen by the left side of each eye, and it goes to the right, imp the nervous impulse goes to the right side of the brain, and the right side of the brain tells the left ha hand, write down what you see, and they will say key. Conversely, input from this side will be acknowledged by this hand, and in most cases by the mouth. Uh, on the other hand, <laughs> uh, uh, if uh, the key ring uh, it is such that, uh, as it were, uh, it can't be seen by either eye separately, then that no one will acknowledge seeing the key ring. Um, and um, that has suggested to some people uh, that we are really two people. Um, but I think that's an exaggeration of the results of these experiments. There are very many different interpretations you can put on it other than that the persons are two persons. I mean, it may just be that what's happened as you have inhibited your, in, uh, that it inhibits your, inabil your ability to say certain things by a certain route. Um, I mean, there are certain things people can explain to you in writing, but not, not, not in words and so on, and maybe it's like that. Right, that's a slight digression, but I, I was wanting to say, as it were, that will give you more, more meat, as it were, for your point of view. Um, yes, well, uh, you could say that once you just get to the uh, single hemisphere situation. But once you start doing this sort of experiment, you won't be confined just to taking one hemisphere out and the other hemisphere out. You could divide the brain in various places and various ways, and uh, uh, the, uh, the issue will still remain. You can't just say there are two people. And uh, the suggestion that there are really a million different people in us begins to be a little implausible. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you are suggesting, in fact, that there, that there might be a fourth uh, right answer to, to this, that is to say uh, that uh, both the subsequent people are Alexandra. No, that won't do, because um, if... Uh, uh, what, what makes this body, my body, is that um, it's under my control, my control being uh, the mental events which are subserved by this brain, and conversely for another body. Um, and my body is that chunk of the universe which I can control and which uh, uh, light rays and sound waves landing on this body produce mental life in me. It is that my body is the vehicle of my operation on the world and my learning about the world. Now, once you get Alexandra and when you get Sandra and Alex, Sandra can control Sandra's body and she knows about the uh, light rays, uh, the effects produced by light rays landing on this body, and conversely for Alex. So they have a quite different mental life from each other. And uh, 
Sandra does not know what is happening, what the mental life of Alex is, and conversely. So she can't be, uh, Sandra can't be Alex because she doesn't have uh, 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 Alex's mental life. So that one, there, there, must, there are two different people, two different sets of mental lives associated with two different bodies. Coming back to Jeff's suggestion, I'm curious how you'd respond to those who don't want to argue that such experiments can have lead to a proliferation of subjects in the individual, but that we should just conclude there is no such thing as a kind of a coherent self subject. Personal identity is kind of a myth that we tell ourselves. Um, <clears throat> so if there is no coherent self, then these personal identity worries are misplaced. Well, wait a minute. Do you wanting to say that in the ordinary case, where I, here am I talking to you, uh, the, there are no coherent selves here? Or is this a view especially for these cases? This would probably be more of, a, probably a stronger version, that that's at least is it extended through time, that there are no selves that extend through time. Well, this goes back to um, the view of partial identity. The question is then, what, what is the relation between you and the person we took to be you yesterday? Um, and if it's partial identity, then it runs into the problem that <laughs> there can be another person who has this sort of relation to you. I mean, if, or rather, let's take a longer time scale. Uh, um, if we take a bit out of your brain and put it into another brain, that uh, candidate won't be as strong a candidate for being you, but it will be a bit less you than uh, um, <laughs> the one who has most of your brain. Now, then the, my arguments go, what would it mean, what does it mean to say that they are partially identical? What are we saying? Uh, there's a connection between them. Now, is it just a causal connection? Is it just that, as it were, you, you and your brain cause this person and its brain? But if you say that, then most of our co uh, common sense beliefs about what we did yesterday and so on would be false. Uh, maybe that you want to say that. Uh, but if you don't say that, then you have to say something like, well, it's not the same, but it's something like the same. But something like the same gets you into the personal identity problem, uh, which I, for the reasons given, I don't think will work. Uh, but if you start denying that, well, you're at all the same person, then you've got to inconsistently consistently take it as applying to you over the course of a whole day. And then there's another argument that comes in. Um, consider your experiences in the course of a whole day. Now, there's a, what, uh, I think it was William James invented the notion of a specious present. That's to say, we're never aware of something that happens an instant. We're aware of the minimum thing we're aware of lasts, who knows? a second or two seconds. Now, suppose it lasts two seconds. Then you will have a series of overlapping experiences during the course of a day. After the day, of course, you've gone to sleep and maybe you don't have any experiences. Um, all right. Now, just take the first two, <laughs> first two-second experience and it overlaps with another two-second experience which starts after one second. Now, you are aware at the same time, of, during the second second, of both of these experiences. So they must happen to the same person. The same, the same person has the same awareness of them. But then that experience, the second experience, overlaps with another one. So it must be the same person that has, is aware of both of these experiences. A series of overlapping experiences must be had by the same person. And so, uh, in the course of a day, it's not plausible to suppose that, as it were, it's anything but you. And, um, well, uh, if you can say, well, perhaps, perhaps uh, 
uh, unconsciousness makes all the difference. Well, um, it's a basic princi epistemological principle, I think, that we must in general believe that things are as they seem to be. Um, if you deny that, then uh, <laughs> what else can make it can be evidence for anything else except the way they seem? Um, and one of the things that seems to us is that we did this yesterday, uh, to me, that I did this yesterday and I did that uh, the day before. And if you deny that, then so much has gone out of our world view that, as it were, we've got nothing that would be evidence for anything else because anything you said about the past would not be on your authority. It wouldn't be you who said it. The same would apply to any, anybody else. Uh, so, um, you, your memories can't be taken, your apparent memories can't be taken as genuine memories of something you said. So why should we believe them, as it were? And uh, unless you do assume that our most obvious common sense beliefs about, you know, we are the same person as this who did this yesterday, are true, then you ultimately deprive yourself of enough of any evidence for anything else about the past, because our only grounds for believing something about the past is because we believe what has been written down, but of course, uh, why should we take anyone's authority for what they wrote down? Because they probably weren't the same person as the person who actually experienced it and then wrote them down. And, and uh, it all, you, there won't be any evidence left to produce any view about anything. So uh, to deny the principle of credulity that things are in general the way they seem to be simply leaves, leaves you to solipsism of me of now as the only thing left. Uh, but skepticism's fine so long as you hold the other bits in place. You've got something left, as it were, to argue for something else on the basis of. But if you deny the very ordinary beliefs about what you did yesterday, there's nothing left. So that's, I, I wouldn't want to do that. It's so obviously the case that I did certain things yesterday. And if that's right, then, as it were, uh, um, it's a, the problems are only going to be, going to arise with the longer term partial identity. And then my, my arguments would, uh, different arguments would come into place. Transitivity of identity. If one of, if Alex is supposedly Alexandra, and Sandra is supposedly Alexandra, given transitivity, then Alex is also Sandra, which seems like we have too many. Uh, yes, but I'm not going down that route, of course. So, uh, no, no, no I'm, I'm, so my question was: Could someone try to deny that by saying, well, what we need is a logic of relative identity that gets us away from these concerns about. Uh, well, um, in the sense, in the sense in which you're using relative identity, it is just the same as partial identity here, and um, that—that's the difficulty it, it runs into. Um, one can't give a sense to partial identity in, in these cases where, where there's uh, where we're dealing with conscious beings. Well, if you want another objection to until half past, yeah? I'll just clarify the um, question. Mm -hmm. uh, what's, your, uh, what's your definition of identity? And uh, what's your definition of identity? Of? Secondly, what's, uh, so first, what's your definition of identity? Of identity? Oh, I, I'm not giving that. Uh, second question is, and the relationship between the soul and the brain. Yeah. Um, identity. 
Some notions are so fundamental that any attempt to define them by other no notions will fail. I mean, if you give a definition, you can define A by B and B by C, but in the end you come to something uh, that you can only define by example, uh, what we're talking about. And, well, something is, uh, A is, I don't, you can say, and I think this is right, but it doesn't necessarily help, uh, that when, uh, um, for some sorts of things, you can define identity in terms of other sorts of things. Um, uh, to say that a tree is the same as an earlier tree is to say something about it having the sa largely the same matter continuous with that of the earlier tree and so on. Um, but um, when we're concerned with identity at a time, not identity over time, at a time, it's uh, just fundamental. Uh, uh, in the case of substances, substance A is the same as the substance B. Uh, if everything, or one condition for it is everything true of the one is true of the other. That's not enough, but it's uh, going to get you most of the way. Um, and you can just see what we're talking about. Uh, that chair is the same as that chair. Oh, I point to the same one each time because all the properties of the first are properties of the second and conversely. Uh, that is not quite enough to get you uh, pure identity because there's the possibility of symmetrical universes in which everything, <laughs> which the, everything has the same property. Two things all have the same property uh, as each other. But uh, you can see what is got being got at by identity by saying, uh, it's the sort of thing that in a normal case is a thing, uh, two things are uh, the same if and only if they have the same properties. And um, uh, it's just talk about the one is always talk about the other. And conversely, I can sort of manipulate, by giving you a lot of different sentences this way, you, you can see what I'm getting at, but it's so fundamental that I can't, as it were, give you a definition in terms of anything more fundamental. Um, you can def give definitions in most cases of being identical, A being identical with B where they occur at different times. Um, the issue is whether you can do it in the case of personal identity, and I wanted to hold that you could if you, uh, uh, by saying that two people are the same if and only if they have the same soul, but then what is it to have the same soul? This is too basic to be defined. They just are. <laughs> Souls just are different from each other. They're not different because they have different properties. And, um, but we can pick out uh, one soul from another soul uh, in terms of this soul is the one that's in control of my body and that soul is the one that's in control of your body. Uh, I can pick them out as different in that way. And uh, since fairly evidently I hope there's only one soul in control of this body, that's, that's enough to pick it out. Uh, but it being that soul is just, well, it's necessary for it to have them <laughs> being that uh, be it for two words to pick out the same, same soul, that all the things that are true of one are true of the other. That's not quite enough, as I've said, but it'll explain to you what, what's at stake. Now, you said, how, how does the bowl, what's the relation between soul and body? Uh, relationship between the soul and the brain. And? The relationship between the soul and the brain. Yes, well, indeed. Uh, very mysterious, I agree with you. Um, but quite obviously happens. Um, uh, forget the soul for the moment. Um, just consider uh, our mental life controls our physical life and conversely, and fairly obviously this is true. Um, if you stick a pin in me, physical, it sets off a disturbance in my brain. I have a feeling by my 
definitions. Uh, feelings are mental, and pains and what's going on in the brain is physical. The one is causing the other. And I don't see how anybody could deny that. Uh, I can make a difference to your mental life in all sorts of ways, and so can you, um, in p public ways. And, to my mind, fairly obviously, and I've got an argument for this if, if you want it, uh, it goes the other way, that is to say, uh, our intentions make a difference to our bodily movements and so on. Uh, there isn't time for me to give this argument, but some of you may be familiar with certain literature which comes from the Libet experiments, which is purport to show that our mental life doesn't make a difference. I have my reasons for supposing that, 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 that those experiments don't and couldn't make, a, uh, couldn't show what they purport to show. But anyway, superficially it looks, and it would need a lot of argument to the contrary, that our mental life makes a difference to what we do. We make a decision to go home, and then we go home. Um, so there is this connection. How it's set up, that is indeed very mysterious, but you mustn't deny that there is a connection just because you can't explain it. <laughs> the connection is so obvious. Uh, how it comes about is another matter. Now, if I'm right about the soul, then it will be the case that uh, the, the mental life is connected with the soul and the f uh, physical life is connected with the body. So uh, um, the question then is, uh, how do souls come into existence and why do they influence the body? And I uh, don't know the answer to that, but the fact I don't know the answer to that doesn't mean that the, the datum is false. Um, humans are not omniscient. But it must be true there is a connection. And uh, some philosophers want to say, well, there can't be because they can't explain it. But that, that philosophers are not omniscient. I think that's probably the time to stop, isn't it? Thank you very well, much. Will you join me in thanking Professor Swinburne for this great talk? <laughs>